You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the latest episode of Star Trek Lower Decks called Trusted Sources. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well. And Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to follow The Secrets of Star Trek in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Tune in your favorite podcast app at our YouTube channel star, at youtube.com slash StarQuest Media, where you should always, of course, hit the bell to get notifications, yada, yada. Uh, and <laughs> it's the same thing every YouTuber tells you. Uh, be sure to follow it. do it. That's the, the important thing. Yes, the do even it thing. Though, even important. though Dom is glossing over it by <laughs> and <laughs> diminishing it by saying yada, 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 the same thing every new YouTuber tells you, do it anyway. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I, I As a YouTube consumer, I just, uh, I, I've gotten jaded. But you're right, Jimmy. I should not gloss over that. Uh, another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy, and you should definitely go to the YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notifications, is Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which you yes. can find even wherever. Even more important. Even more yep. important, which you can find at YouTube.com slash Jimmy Aiken or at SQPN.com slash Mysterious and, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Uh, stick around to the end. It is very important that you stick around to the end because we will have some great listener feedback uh, on a previous episode. But First, I want to hear, Jimmy, what is a, your recap for this episode? This week, we follow the long tradition of science fiction shows having a reporter come on board to do a story about our heroes, only to turn it into a vicious hit piece. Mm -hmm. Captain Freeman is thus nervous about the reporter, whose name is Victoria Nuse, which is a trait name. Victoria Nuse, Victorious Newsy, get it? Mm. Nuse is here to cover the first trial of a program Captain Freeman has been advocating for years. It's called Project Swingby, and its purpose is to visit non-Federation planets that haven't been contacted in a while, check on them, and offer to help if they need it. So, we're going to the planets Onara and Brekka from the Season 1 Next Gen episode Symbiosis, which was the one that starred Bennu the Phoenix and Johnny Slash from Square Pegs. <laughs> it turns out that the Onarans are doing just fine, uh, so they decide to go to the sister planet Brekka instead. While on board, Victoria interviews crew members about what it's like working on the Cerritos, and even though Captain Freeman has been blocking Mariner from talking to the reporter, Mariner does so anyway, and insists she's just going to tell the truth. When uh, Victoria interviews the captain herself, she reveals that she's been hearing very unflattering things about the ship. Captain Freeman assumes it was Mariner who told her the unflattering things, and in a fit of pique, she transfers Mariner to that famous hellhole, Starbase 80. When the ship gets to Brekka, they discover that the Breen have taken over the planet. The Breen then attack the Cerritos, which is almost destroyed, but they're saved at the last minute by a new Texas-class drone ship that, the Star that Starfleet has been secretly working on. Afterwards, when Nuse's expose on the Cerritos airs, it turns out that everyone on the crew unintentionally said things that Nuse could twist to make Captain Freeman look bad, except Mariner. She only said warm, positive things. Realizing that she's made a terrible mistake, Captain Freeman calls Starbase 80, but she learns that Mariner has resigned her Starfleet commission, and in our final scene, we learn that Mariner is now working with Petra Aberdeen, the space archaeologist who offered her a job a few episodes ago, so they've now paid off Chekhov's job offer. The end. <laughs> Dom, you're muted again. I tried to do, I, I muted so that I don't, in, you know, make noises that interrupt you as you do the recap, but okay. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so they, it's, yeah, not Anton, uh, or not Pavel Chekhov's uh, job offer, but uh, the other one, Chekhov. Anton Chekhov. Yes. Yeah, the playwright. The playwright. So uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the Project Swing By was original, was Freeman's idea from the season one finale. Uh, this idea that, because the Cerritos' actual mission is, uh, second contact. Second contact. First contact's made. They show up right after that and do all the the administrative paperwork. details, the paperwork, right? Uh, but this is 
how about coming going by much later when you know just to see how these things are doing and so they they do the first mission is to uh this these ornara um which they have to check on the planet that picard left cold turkey they say because yeah, which he did yeah he broke their addiction or broke their relationship didn't break the addiction necessarily but broke their relationship with brecca which was their dealer uh and left them to recover cold turkey on their own which is Interesting. Yeah, and I went back just because I had some extra time one evening. I went back and rewatched that episode, and for a first season episode, it's not that bad. Um, it's actually pretty good. Um, what's happened is you have these two planets in a solar system. They both got hit by a plague a long time ago, and the cure was a plant that's on Breca, and they used it to make a drug called Felicium, which they then shipped to Onara. And it also cured the plague there, but it's also addictive. And the Breckens realized this and got off their addiction, whereas the Onarans did not realize it and have been addicted for 200 years and think that they're still infected with the plague and still need to take the Felicium treatment in order to not die. Um, so, um, and, and actually it's become a really imbalanced society. The Onarans were technologically advanced, but now no longer know how to repair their own ships. And they have multiple industries that are all devoted to buying Felicium from Breca. Meanwhile, the Breccans, who were not technologically advanced, are living high on the hog in luxury, and their only industry is producing Felicium. Mm. So this is a very exploitative, unbalanced relationship. And when Picard learns all of this due to a complex um, for, uh, prime directive, I almost said First Amendment, due to a, due to a complex <laughs> uh, prime directive thing, he concludes that what he needs to do is leave them be. And their failing starships, which he was going to repair for them, he says, sorry, can't do that. Um, and, and this is your last shipment of Felicium. And after that, you guys are on your own. Yes. They keep it, making sure they have to take the uh, updated vaccine boosters for the Felicium, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for every variant of the plague. Mm -hmm. that comes. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Don't write, don't write, me, oh. <laughs> don't, don't write me stories to YouTube. Don't put up a uh, warning. So, yeah. uh, um, so that, that's the, the basis for this project swing by visit. Yeah. And so the, they're I, expecting I, I, Ornara to be devastated. Mm -hmm. And they show yeah. up and it's pretty paradisical, actually, although there are great undertones oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they have they have like a mural of, yeah, here's Picard, here's the Enterprise leaving us and here we all are freaking out and here we are committing to diet and exercise. And, <laughs> yeah. and, he, and, and the Onaran leader says, oh, yeah, you know, think we hit a rough patch after that for, it's 17 years ago. He says, yeah, yeah we hit a rough patch for, you know, the first 10 or 14 years, but, <laughs> yeah. but then things straightened out and we committed to, to diet and exercise. And Ransom is impressed by this and says, oh, that's great. I bench 250. What do you, what do you, ben what do you bench? And the guy says, oh, we don't do it so much to, to compete as to quiet the voices in our heads. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They're not so good. Anymore. Yeah, so they're not doing so good. <laughs> <laughs> that that was pretty funny. You know, I should back up just a bit because I want to establish this, what's going on with Mariner uh, because Freeman has this idea that the lower decks are going to embarrass her, like that her ship is full of these these crewmen who are just kind of, you know, mess ups and screw ups and they're going to embarrass her in front of this reporter. And so she's looking for ways to prevent this. And one of the things is the uh, the social event of the season for the crew is the annual pie eating contest uh that everyone loves and so she cancels that and uh, uh at one point i forget who, the, who says it but the someone says you know there's plenty to do around here that doesn't end in sugary diarrhea yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Bo Bumler says for you speak, maybe <laughs> speak yeah. for yourself <laughs> that was a that was an image well, um and and of course uh Freeman's not just worried about any lower deckers, but uh, beta beta team, which of course is Mariner and company, and she's yeah. most worried that Mariner is going to try to try to uh, subvert make her, her look bad, you know, <laughs> make her and, look bad before this this. And Mariner doesn't get story. that that Freeman is embarrassed by her. She keeps putting this positive spin on it. Oh, of course she's not embarrassed by us. We're great. We're the best part of this this crew. 
Mm. Well, uh, yeah, Mariner, uh, I don't recall that line specifically, but yeah. throughout, Mariner is um, remarkably calm and mature. Mm -hmm. And she really has showing how she's grown as a character. Um, she's contextualizing things and it's like, yeah, Carol's going to Carol, but really this was not a big deal. And she, and she's, she's right. She, you know, except she's not, um, but she's taking a very mature adult perspective on things. And, and it, the problem is that Captain Freeman doesn't realize how much her daughter has grown. Right. In, probably in part because she's pushed her off on Ransom and Ransom is now Mariner's direct supervisor. She has not seen how Mariner has grown, particularly in the last season. And um, and so even Ransom is shocked when when Carol wants to kick her off the ship. He he doesn't see Mariner that way. Yeah. You, know, you know, there's an interesting subtext to the story of, you know, parents and their children who grow up and have become mature adults but who still treat them as if they were the, still the same adolescence mm -hmm. with, yeah. you know, impulse control. and Welcome to your future, Dom. <laughs> I'm starting to live that future, actually, right now. Uh, <laughs> I, in the later stages of adolescence, uh, or I hope. And, <laughs> and uh, But it's an interesting subtext here because it really hits it on the nose. Mariner has become, you know, she's still Mariner. She's still the same personality. But the rough edges have kind of been shaved off a bit, and she's not that uh, chaos element that she used to be. She really is trying to do a good thing here on board this ship and nobody mm -hmm. believes her. Even her friends don't really believe that she didn't, she wasn't the source of the screw up. Yeah. In fact, after, after, after Freeman fires her, she's like wandering through the halls, getting ready to leave the ship and meeting other people. And they're all shunning her. Even Jennifer, the Andorian shuns her. Everybody assumes that it was her that said stuff to the reporter that was bad when really it was all of them and they just didn't realize it. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it, it was interesting. And she, she doesn't, you know, try, I mean, she sort of tries to defend herself, but she doesn't come right out and, you know, explain. She wants she wants them to accept her as she is. Um, although she does say at one point, "Am I in a frame of mind situation?" Which is a reference to the TNG episode "Frame of Mind," where Riker was being psychically tortured, uh, mm -hmm. etc. So uh, I thought that was funny. There, there was there's a great line in this as she's wandering through and she runs into the conspiracy theorist guy and he's like, mm -hmm. "I know this is all part of the temporal cold war, but what you did was really messed up." <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. He's he's always got these weird conspiracy theories, which aren't always separated from reality, which is the funny thing. Yep. Um, so, so you know, getting back to Ornara, the, you know, Freeman's point in going to Ornara is project swing by is we go to these planets and we, and they need us and they show how much they need Starfleet and especially the Cerritos to come and help them after their previous encounter with Starfleet. But they show up and the Ornarans don't need them. And it puts in jeopardy her whole plan for impressing this reporter, which is kind of uh, yeah, amusing. And the reporter, especially initially, comes across as fairly straightforward and sincere. Um, it's So there are like a couple of Babylon 5 episodes where we had a reporter come on board and do stories, and it always turned into hit pieces, which is what happens here, too. Yeah. But the the Babylon 5 reporters were much, especially the second, were much slimier in in their approach. In fact, the second one admits we're, we've got a totalitarian government back home. Of course, we can't tell the whole truth, but we will try to get some of the truth out. And then that turns out to be totally not true. <laughs> He's not planning on getting any of the truth out. Um but we have the same kind of person arrives on a ship. They got a little floating camera with them. They're going to do the story. And uh, Victoria Nuse is initially being given a tour of the ship by Captain Freeman. And she like takes her to the rear viewing port, you know, where you can see the back of the ship, you know, as you're flying through space. And Victoria says, covering a California class starship is really special for me. My family is from Flagstaff. <laughs> and 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 Captain Freeman uncomfortably says, "Yes, uh, Arizona is very near California." <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I really that was a good one. Oh man, yeah. You know, it's interesting to how they 
the the distrust of the media is at an all time high in 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 society in the U S society today, mm-hmm. and it's interesting to see because how, duh, <laughs> well, yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. It's clearly biased. Even the people for whom they agree with the bias yeah. know it's biased, and it's and it's interesting to see how often it shows up in Star Trek, which is not a conservative medium you know a conservative show they have very progressive views on things and so it's kind of interesting to see how how people just take for granted that the media is biased and we see it very clearly in this episode well and the same thing on babylon 5 back in the 90s i mean J. j michael straczynski is a hollywood liberal but he recognized the media is totally slanted and not on your side Right. And in, in, in the 90s is nothing compared to what it is today. I mean, yeah. now I, I re- actually just recently heard a, I think it was through the Pillar Catholic, uh, as a survey on media popularity. And they, you know, they said even back in the 90s, you know, the media, obviously there was that understanding, but the majority of people still recognize the media as somewhat trustworthy. And now it's, it's completely changed since that Babylon 5 episode came out. Now it is. Most people recognize the media isn't trustworthy. It does have their biases. In their views, which is probably a good thing to recognize, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, now the media has even stopped pretending to be balanced and yeah. they're just full on partisans. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Don't it's the, that, you know, whenever you talk to a reporter, always be careful, always be aware, you know, of how your words can be used. It's like reality <laughs> TV. If you're going to be on a reality TV show, just be aware they cut and edit. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's what we get here is this, this reporter cuts the interviews, not with Mariner, but with the rest of the crew in such a way as to make, you know, uh, Captain Freeman into Starfleet's shame as the headline, yeah. the, you know, the black and white uh, uh, picture of Freeman as the, you know, the title card for the, the news report puts it, um, you know, it's, 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 she's really slanted. I mean, all of the things that she, that comes up in a report, and let me name some of them. You know, the ransom turned into a giant head that tried to eat the ship. Free- <laughs> Freeman's- that was kind of a one-off deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dealt with this. Freeman's breakdown on a spot on the spa trip with the engineers yeah, take, taking off on a, on a spa trip, uh, uh, f- transporting a Dupler into a party it, that, you know, that to get uh, party, revenge, to get yeah. revenge, um, giving a Pandronian drill instructor, a poly heart attack, which was funny. Um, <laughs> Kayshawn being turned into a puppet, the spear wielding aliens taking over the Cerritos, uh, Cork getting kidnapped, as we saw a couple of episodes ago, Peanut Hamper, as we saw two episodes ago, uh, the thing with Q and Veritas. So, you know, yeah, sure, but you could do the same thing to the Enterprise in TNG yeah. or TOS and or whatever. And that's, with any, that, any adventure show, there has to be an adventure and you can rip the adventure out of context. Exactly, exactly. And that's really the point is. Yeah, I mean, it's that's if if it were a boring ship, it wouldn't be an interesting news article, but also wouldn't be an interesting TV show. Uh, so, um, yeah. So uh, th- this it, this assumption uh, that Mariner is the one who undermined the entire ship is what ends up getting her transferred to Starbase City and basically disowned by her mom. That was the other part of it mm-hmm, is that mm-hmm. she disowns her. I don't even think of myself as your mother anymore. Which well, is I don't I don't even know if I can think of you as my daughter anymore yeah yeah um so we we do get the payoff on starbase 80 oh and of course yeah. our the, the shuttle craft that comes from starbase 80 looks like a broken down piece of junk yeah uh, and the two guys are like local yokels uh that show up i mean they were pretty funny um here's your here's your jumpsuit uniform uh oh One there's my one yeah. size fits most. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where I left my sandwich. See, I told you I didn't eat it. <laughs> she was wrapped up in the uh, jumpsuit. Um, and even when she, when Freeman later calls the Starbase and is talking to the guy, someone off screen is chasing a bat with a broom. Hit it with the broom. Hit it with the broom. <laughs> I just, uh, was, oh, that was so funny. Um, I'd kind of like to see a story on Starbase 80. Yes, yeah. that would be funny just to have them go there. Um so meanwhile, the Cerritos goes to Brecca. So we go from Ornara. Hopefully some, there's something going on at Brecca that we can solve that could be helpful with. Um, but when they get there, uh, this Brecca, again, the plant that had been exploding Ornara, they find a ghost town. Um, and it turns out that the Breen are there, had been at, had, were uh, taking over, invading Brecca, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, we saw like one of the native Breccans get vaporized by a Breen in front of yeah. Ransom. 
that was pretty dramatic. And um, they have to be rescued. And uh, the, 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 we see this fully automated starship uh, called the Alito. Is that a, that's going to be, a ta- I didn't look it up. Is that a town in Texas? Oh, uh, so. uh, no, the, the, the rescue ship, it's not Alito. Um, oh, okay. It is, let's see. Yeah, it's Alito, Texas. It is a town in Texas. A-L-E-D-O. Oh, okay. Alido. Yeah, Alido. Oh, sorry, my Alido. Boston accent uh, got in the way there. Um, okay. So in the tradition of the California class being named after minor mm-hmm. towns yeah. in California, be it minor towns in got Texas. A lot, no of them in, a lot of them in, no, no, you got lots of little tiny towns in Texas and in, uh, and in California. Yep. 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 Uh, yeah, so uh, interesting idea that we have a a drone, fully automated drone ship. Um, mm-hmm. I don't. I wonder if we'll see that get a focus because you know the potential downfalls and problems of a ship that is mm-hmm. completely automated. Um, that, that, Maybe that you know eliminating the human element or the sentient element or sentient person element. Uh, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Sorry, it, Star Trek makes it's, it so difficult. It's been tried before in Star Trek. Yep. Yes. Yes. The the ultimate uh, computer. Yeah, that's what Captain Dunsell. Yes, in the, uh, the 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 um, what's his name? The the doctor went crazy. The Daystrom. Not Daystrom. Daystrom. Oh, yeah. Thinking of vacuum cleaners. Um. So, <laughs> uh, so so the they what was it? Uh, Ransom says to Freeman. Well, you know, Project Swing by wasn't a complete failure. I mean, it did reveal a Breen incursion, which yeah. wasn't mm-hmm. its aim. Um. So the 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 end the end result is um mariners revealed to, to not have been the problem that everyone else who pointed a finger at mariner themselves were the problem um and she only said good things and uh and so that mariner ends when freeman realizes this and wants to you know reconcile mm-hmm. mariner's gone mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and with you know lara croft in space um petra mm-hmm. aberdeen so my guess is we've got how many episodes left of uh, the season? One. One more, right? That's right. Oh, obviously, yeah. Duh. Um, my guess is resolution because Lodex doesn't tend to drag these things out. So no. my guess is resolution in that episode. Well, she may or may not get back on. I mean, obviously she'll be in the next episode, and she won't. It won't be in Starfleet. She may rejoin Starfleet by the end of the episode, or they mm-hmm. may stretch that into the beginning of next season. Right, right, like they did with Boimler. Yeah, I I have a feeling they'll they'll it'll be that whatever the mission is in the next episode will be on the same planet that they're on, so it'll be they'll they'll they'll, they'll bring the two ships together, the two crews together very quickly. I have a feeling, and they're gonna go mummy it up because those (laughs) mummies aren't gonna dig themselves up. Usually, (laughs) a little disturbing. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) once or twice that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mariner does have a good line here which with the, the one nice thing that is in that whole uh, interview. She says, there's the family you're born into, right? And then the family you choose. I got both here in the Cerritos. If you're measuring by heart, this is the strongest ship in the fleet because we've got the best captain at the helm, my mom. Man, I would, if I were Carol Freeman, <laughs> that would mm-hmm. just turn the knife. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so um, any, any other thoughts about this episode, Father Corey? No, this was, I enjoyed this one. This was a pretty good one. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, anything else? Uh, Let's see. So early on, when Captain Freeman learns from Admiral um, Buenamiga that the reporter is going to be coming, uh, she's immediately perplexed, and she's in a briefing with her senior staff, and she tells the senior staff, we've got to clean up this ship before the reporter gets here. And they all start laughing. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and and she says, why are you laughing? And Dr. Ta'ana says, oh, blank, she's serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was good. <laughs> oh, yeah. it, it also, one thing I was a little disappointed they didn't do in this episode is, so if you go back and you watch Symbiosis, I mean, the thing I remembered Symbiosis for is, okay, it's the one with the drug pushers and the drug addicts. And it's got Benu from the Phoenix, who was also Joachim from Star Trek Two. He mm-hmm. was one of Khan's. He was like Khan's underling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you also have Johnny Slash from Square Pegs, 
who is one of the addicts. And they have the ability to transmit electricity through their hands. And this is part of how they fight. So like early on in that episode, uh, Benu and Johnny Slash grab each other by the arms and are shocking each other. And then there's a discussion between Tasha Yar, because it's an early episode. This is the mm-hmm. episode immediately before Skin of Evil, where Tasha dies. But um, Tasha Yar and Riker are talking about this electric eel ability that these people have. They don't name electric eels, but they do mention that animals, some animals have this ability. Mm-hmm. And they speculate maybe it's connected with their son, which is weird. Um, and then later in the episode, when Picard has said, you're not going to get the drugs... Um, Johnny Slash grabs Riker and puts his hand on his chest and starts shocking him. And Riker is just convulsed Mm -hmm. by this. And he says, unless you give us the drugs, this person is going to die. And he says it a couple of times that way, this person is going to die. Um, And that uh, hand electric eel ability is so interesting. I was a little disappointed they didn't revisit it. Mm -hmm. um, In this, because it's one of the more memorable things about both of their species. Yeah, it is interesting, by the way, that Symbiosis, those two actors were both in Wrath of Khan. You know, mm-hmm. Merrick Buttrick was, uh, you know, uh, Kirk's son. David, yeah, David Marcus Kirk's son. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. And then Joaquin is the one of uh, Khan's guys. Um, and I do remember that being an interesting episode. Like you said, one of the better of the first mm-hmm. season of TNG. Uh, so I'm glad they, they picked that one mm-hmm. um, to, to do. Also, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Milimo, his, upon being given charge of the bridge, the first thing he wants to do is call his mother, his yeah. Meemaw, to let her see him being captain. Yeah. And then when Freeman shows up up on the bridge, what's Meemaw doing here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Meemaw, I told you not to call me at work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was good. Awesome. Anything else? Nope. All right. So I did promise some listener feedback, and this comes from our last episode. Uh, crisis point two paradoxus where uh Sage electric of- boogaloo this time it's personal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go the uh the this comment comes from the, the sage of rakaseka on youtube who we were talking about um all the movie references and so mm-hmm. he, and we we couldn't find one for star trek six so he says the star trek six references might be in that the cerritos being rescued by the wayfarer which is like the enterprise being rescued by the excelsior in star trek six six uh he says then i know also, they were trying to save a diplomatic summit like in six. Not much clear there. So I, I suppose it could be a connection. But yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hard. The six parallels are if they're there, they're definitely the weaker ones. By the way, that reminded me of one other note on this episode. Kayshawn is talking almost totally normal. Mm-hmm. Right. He's right. he's apparently learned how to talk in a straightforward way because when he's talking in interviews to the reporter, he, I mean, he like makes a reference to a cave and she's like, do you live in a cave? And he's, oh, no, 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 that's a metaphor. Although I have lived in a cave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But he's, 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 he's nowhere near as opaque as he's been in previous episodes. Right, right. They made him, yeah, more understandable over time. Yeah. All right. So I want to make a note about what's coming up. So we're definitely, next time we're talking about the season finale of Lower Decks. Uh, mm-hmm. But as folks may know, the same day that the mm-hmm. season finale of Lower Decks is coming out is also the season, not the season premiere, the, the, the first new episode of Star Trek Prodigy in the middle of season one, because they split it up, um, is also dropping the same day. So next time we will be we'll be talking about the Lower Decks finale. Then right after that, we'll have another episode. We won't, we won't wait a whole week. We'll have another episode drop probably the next day. Uh, of our discussion of that episode of Prodigy. So the, the, just so you all know, that's coming uh, one right after the other next week. So, all right. So we'd like to take a moment before we go to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Joe K, Guy N, Paula K, Keith M, and Christopher M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. This StarQuest show is also brought to you in part by Jacqueline Brown, the best-selling author of The Light Series. Check out her new release, Altered, on Amazon or any fine bookstore. Learn more about her and her work at sqpn.com slash brown. 
So that's it from us. We would love to hear what you thought of this Lower Decks episode, Trusted Sources. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Starquest Media. You can send an email to trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. We'll be back next time. We'll be discussing the final episode of season three of Lower Decks. And until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Don. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you. Live long and prosper, and let's mummy it up. <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, we have medical supplies, engineering know-how, and unlimited snacks. 